Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian, and it's great to be on here once again with my friend who likes to be called El Jefe because <laughs> it gets back to his Latino roots. El Jefe is in La Casa Mis Amigos. There you go. Four years of Spanish. That's what it came to. My great friend, Pete Carmichael, is here. Pete, how are you, buddy? I'm doing, I'm doing great. I did not request to be called El Jefe, but if people want to call me that, I, I don't care what anyone calls me. I'm, I'm easy going. I'll go with, fine with that. I have, absolutely. Yeah. John, what's your shirt? What's on your shirt? Uh, <laughs> my shirt is We've Got the Kaiser's Goat. It's kind of hard to see, but. Yeah, no, stand up and see it, man. And uh, it's an old uh, poster after we, after we and the Allies won the First World War. So uh, it's a little beat up little goat there for the Kaiser. And. Uh, <laughs> He says he's got a headache. <laughs> so, so I figure Memorial Day is a great day to be uh, to, to, to have that on. So John and I have spent a, a lot of time together today. Uh, we were on the battlefield this morning with our friends Chris Gwynn and Jim Brumall, and we were walking Pickett's Charge. And that's what I was going to share screen, but I can't do it now. And this no. is Elliot 1864, I believe, map. Uh, Elliot. Mm -hmm. Canvas the battlefield here at Gettysburg. He also did Antietam as well. But at Gettysburg, he marked all of the grave sites that he stumbled across. And we were particularly interested in the grave sites near the Evansburg Road in the area of where Pettigrew's charge took place. And, you know, this is a moment, of course, to reflect upon uh, Memorial Day and to think about all those men here at Gettysburg who perished and, of course, uh, never made it back. Mm -hmm. uh, their homes uh, to that final resting place and to think of all those families and the uncertainty that they lived with uh, for months and then mm -hmm. before they finally got confirmation that they had uh, lost their loved ones here. So I thought a lot about that. I thought about also my father. Uh, my father, uh, 18 years old, was drafted um, and went straight to the Korean War and uh, was a war that, uh, or I should say an experience in which he did not divulge a lot of details to me, but it certainly was a, uh, an experience that cast a shadow over his life that he never could quite uh, escape. He had immense pride in being a veteran. And uh, he also told me that the happiest day of his life uh, was not when he married my mother, um, not the day that I was born, but the day uh, that his leg was broken in Korea. They got him somehow out of the front hmm. and, and into Japan. <laughs> and I think like, that was the happiest day of his life. <laughs> uh, but I think about him a lot, and I think about all the other veterans, which brings us to Carolyn. Carolyn Hawk, who is from Chicago. We'll talk a little bit about Chicago, but before we divulge about your background, I had the opportunity to meet Carolyn's parents here in Gettysburg a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, we had a delightful, I think, breakfast, and um, they told me about... Carolyn's grandfather on her mother's side, um, World War II vet. And I don't know, Carolyn, would you just say a little bit about him? Do you mind? I think it's a fascinating story because he returned with, I believe, your father and maybe a, either your brother or your uncle back to France, right? So you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that. Yeah, of course. So my grandfather and my mom's father had bravely fought during the liberation of France towards the ends of uh, World War II. And he was wounded in the process, but for his valor, he has received countless awards, including the Purple Heart and more recently, the Knights of Honorable Legion from France. Um, and actually, it's been a bit rough for the past couple, well, month and a half or so. My grandfather actually passed in early April. Oh God, um, I didn't know this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so today was actually the first Memorial Day that my sisters and I weren't marching alongside with him. Oh. It was a, yeah. So we were, we were thinking about him quite yeah. today, yes. <laughs> well, you know, I have a pretty feeble memory, actually. And the very fact that I was able to recall this, I don't know, powers above are directing me uh, so that we could speak about him today. Because I also remember that when he returned to France, uh, which was, as you can only imagine, a very powerful experience for him, and that they had made arrangements for him to go to one of the sites, I thought it was in the Luberon, maybe. I, I could very well be wrong about that. But they did spent the night, and they were going to go to the battlefield the next day. They had arranged for a guide. And your grandfather said, you know what? Let's take a pass on that. I want to get back to Paris. And so, you know, we don't think about that in terms of our civil war. 
you know, how many men in 1913 said, yeah, you know, I saw it once and that was enough and I, I can't go back. I can't confront that. I can't face that. So, you know, how these men and these women come to terms with the ordeal of combat and of military experience in general, it just absolutely defies easy characterization. So I'm glad we got to remember your grandfather today. I'm very sorry about his passing. So Carolyn, let's talk a little bit about you. You've already divulged revealed that you're a Chicago native and of course in Chicago right now. Carolyn is a very busy young woman. She is a double major in history as well as art history, got that right, minoring in public history and Italian. Two majors, two minors, and then does a range of other things. She's the co-founder of the Gettysburg History Club which I can't even imagine. That must be a demanding job. <laughs> everybody together, getting speakers and all that kind of thing. So you're co-founder of the History Club. And and I'm mildly not annoyed, I would say, uh, her. I have not been asked, John, to come to her radio show. She has a radio wow. show on campus. And I once in a while mention, you know, someone that I'm interested in. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm just not cutting edge enough for her radio, radio show. Is that true, Carolyn? Wow. Not true at all. The whole premise of the show is to pick a U.S. destination, research the music and artists from that place. And mm -hmm. Indiana was definitely on the list for the rest of the semester. So the invitation was waiting. We just never returned to campus. I just didn't act upon it. We, with Indiana, we've got Michael Jackson, Axl Rose, David Lee Roth, John Mellencamp, and the list goes on. Right. right. The list goes on. The other thing, and this is a time for me to air grievances, Carolyn. You didn't know that or you wouldn't have accepted the invitation. <laughs> she, Carolyn was in uh, Italy. She studied for a semester. Yes. Yeah. And while she was there, I was hinting, and I mean hinting, that she was going to go, you know, see some fashion shows possibly. And I thought, hey, just maybe my student will bring back a scarf. John, right. do you think right. I have a scarf from Italy? What well, do you think? If the story went this direction, I'd say no. Yeah, absolutely, I did not. I did not. Well, I'll tell you what. I I went to Milan. I saw some of the models and the fashion that they were wearing, and it's n incomparable to your style, honestly. You I, know what? I I love it. It. This is why we get kids like this at Gettysburg College. You know exactly what to say and to suck up to the professor when it's a critical moment. I like it. I like right. it a lot. So, uh, Carolyn, also, and then we're going to ease into the Civil War here. This summer, Carolyn, and I, of course, I don't, I do have it right in front of me here. Could you tell them what you're doing for your summer internship, which I think is interesting? Sure. So I'll be working with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation that's based in D.C. for the summer. And a lot of my projects this summer will be doing research on past preservation initiatives and current programs, uh, creating content for their website and social media outreach. And then they also have this series called uh, Preservationists in Your Neighborhood. And I'll be conducting oral history slash interviews for that as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, and then Carolyn's uh, internship two summers ago, I believe, yes. was at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, Carolyn, we had Beth Parnitska, who I don't believe, was she your chief of interp when you were there? I got to work with her towards the end of the summer, yes. Good. So we've interviewed Beth on the show as well. Right. So, uh, just for you know, a little bit, I'd like for you um, to reflect upon what it meant uh, to do interpretation at Appomattox, you know, what were some of those encounters that you had with the audience that were memorable for you? Sure. At the core of my internship, you know, we had to develop a 25 to 30 minute discussion on really whatever we wanted, as long as it was pertinent to the site. And I decided to create my talk based on the uh, emotionally charged period of reconstruction, starting with the surrender on April 9th. And I, you know, at the time I definitely, I was aware that people come to the site from all over and they want to know all the historical events. So I was sure to include the history of the campaign, what had gone on on April 9th of 1865, the days right after, and then how that all fits in into the big picture of reconstruction. And it's such a complex history. And for some, it's such an emotional one as well. Uh -huh. So of course, I learned real fast how to adjust my talk and read an audience. Because you know, I, I found that people in the 19th century had very different ideas of what surrender would look like and the end of the Civil War would look like for civilians, for soldiers, and how to reintegrate the South into the North. 
And I discovered that people still have very different ideas of how the Civil War ended today. Um, for some, it didn't end. So, so I had some encounters with that. But overall, it was a fantastic learning experience. Right, right. One of the things, um, Carolyn, that we talked to Beth about is how the official interpretation of Appomattox, which well into the, I would say, 1990s, uh, it was very much about the theme of reconciliation, that this is where the nation came back together. And the idea that the war continued in another guise during reconstruction was something that was almost never mentioned or, or thought about, either from the staff or especially from the visitors. And the very fact that that was the thrust of your interpretive program, it just uh, it makes me feel really good about how the field of public history has allied with academic historians to think more broadly about these sites without losing the reason why people even go there. And that's of course to see where Lee surrendered to Grant, but you've able to tease out that greater significance, which is really, again, very exciting, I think, development uh, to see that trajectory of change uh, over, over time. How about being a woman interpreter there and being a young woman interpreter there? Did you think that there were any unique challenges to that or, or not? You know, at Appomattox specifically, there were moments of bias from visitors, but I, I honestly think gender bias in the field of interpretation, in the field of history is on its way out. I think as individuals, we all find our paths and our ways into history. And I've been fortunate enough to be raised with incredible supportive people um, that really introduced me into historical studies and subjects. And, it, you know, of course, it comes with a line of fantastic teachers along the way. And I think I really, really fell in love with history in my senior year of high school. Um, my favorite high school teacher, Robert Seidel, actually challenged me to submit this documentary I made on the Chicago automobile industry for the Chicago uh, Metro History Fair. And it, I was awarded a blue ribbon at the state level competition, which was thrilling. So having that supportive network of teachers and past experiences, I think really prepared me to continue those studies into college where I've met so many other female historians and students alike doing incredible things and research with their um, studies. And of course, I'm learning from very distinguished professionals and female scholars in the field. It's it's all very inspiring. Yeah, yeah. good, good. Well, that's wonderful to hear as well. So now we'll ease into why we've gathered this evening to talk about your research on Ben Butler and the women of New Orleans. So uh, let's just start about, tell us how you got into the project, right? And then if you don't mind, just sort of then transition to give our audience a, a, a quick historical background about New Orleans spring of 62 and Ben Butler. Sure, well, I came to research this because I was enrolled in your class a year ago, History 339, Old South to New South. And the project that we had to complete for the semester was to research a Southern society through the lens of newspapers and to sort of read in between the lines to get information on the Latin history of groups and communities in that location. So I broadly started looking at New, um, New Orleans and narrowing down my research throughout the semester. So we'll start with that. And then the historical background, okay. New Orleans was this growing metropolitan city in the years leading up to the Civil War. It was this huge cons um, consumer port. It was, you know, strategic for the Union Army to pursue that city once the war broke out. Mm -hmm. So in the early years of the Civil War, in the spring of 1862, you have Union Admiral David Farragut and his squadron essentially surrounding the city via the Mississippi River after bypassing two major forts, um, Fort St. Phillips and Fort Jackson. And over the course of five days, the city capitulated essentially to F Farragut. And by May 1st, you had Union General Benjamin Butler marched roughly 2,500 Union troops into New Orleans and the city fell under occupation. Good, excellent background there. So um, with occupation, 
uh, these troops are confronting mostly a civilian po a civilian population, of course, a civilian population that has uh, some women in it of all classes and of racial backgrounds. So what was the question that interested you about military occupation and its relationship to the women of New Orleans? Well, when I initially started my research, I had heard about New Orleanian occupation. So I was looking at newspapers that were specifically in the months where, of course, the city fell under Union occupation. And I had come across this very, very brief mention in a newspaper of this furious female, and I have the quote right in front of me, um, with but one eye and badly marked with smallpox, was yesterday arrested in the second district, charged with deporting herself in a very violent manner. She said she would kill General Butler or any other damn son of a bitch, and that the Yankees were all a damn lousy set. And immediately I thought, she's great. <laughs> she's interesting. Yeah. I had to look uh, into her further. I mean, there hardly is any information on this woman in general, but my, you know, from there, I started to look at how Southern women in general reacted to union occupation. So let's backpedal. We'll come back to this woman who interested you. And I'd like, again, for you, I know you have some maybe documents you want to show us, and I certainly don't want to get in the way of that. Let's get some altitude on this. And let me ask you, um, the war came, and it's clear to those in power in the Confederacy that the support of Southern women of all classes and races, even enslaved women, that their loyalty and their support is integral, right? So on the one hand, they need their political support, but on the other hand, they proclaim, as people had proclaimed throughout time, that women aren't political by nature and they can't be political. So here is, of course, the rub. The rub is Confederate ruling class needs women to be loyal, but oh, but wait a minute, you can't really be too loyal and, and, and for God's sake, don't dissent, right? So explain to us, help us understand what did it mean in terms of the idea? What is the idea of being a loyal Confederate woman? And when I say that, we're talking about white women of the upper class. What do we mean by that? And then we can talk about the reality. So at the very beginning of the Civil War and especially before Union occupation, Southern femininity was very much based on respectability and high virtue. So of course, New Orleans was deemed as this devil city, essentially. There was so much crime, it was dirty. It just wasn't a place for, you know, Southern female gentry. So towards the Civil War, you have New Orleans delegating specific parks and gardens and specific spaces for women to socialize, to basically just walk the streets because in some areas or at certain times of the day, if a woman was seen walking alone, her very virtue was at stake. She could be mistaken for a woman of the night, for example. So there was this importance of maintaining that virtue and this respectability. But towards the Civil War, we also have women starting to attend public rallies, they're going to campaign speeches, they're present in politics. They're not entirely active yet. And I think what we discover when we start looking at how these women were initially reacting to the Civil War, they had to be respectable, respectable and virtuous at the home. The home was the safest place for them. And I think in terms of politics, being a loyal Confederate and defending the Confederacy, defending the home and New Orleans was all good and well, as long as she was being respectable about it and being respectable in the home. So let's again, drill that down a little bit more before then we talk about the reality of New Orleans. I guess when you mean respectability, things that women did do uh, that didn't raise any eyebrows uh, could sew socks, right? <laughs> right, right, make mittens, uh, prepare food to send to the soldiers. Oh, I don't know, donate your wedding dress to become a Confederate flag, uh, to go to a send off of the troops, right, and to sing a song. But above all else, of course, where women could serve the Confederacy in a respectable way is through spirituality, right? It's through prayer. It's encouraging the men to also be religious and to be moral. And so to be supportive, but to be supportive in ways, as you've said, that respectability is very much in line with domesticity, right? That's the high idea. 
that's a high idea and we should just point out that can be achieved more easily if you're a woman of privilege, especially if you're a woman that is a slave owner. This is a hard thing to do if you're a poor woman, white or black, right? Yeah. To live up to that idea of respectability. I'll turn over to John here, but we can maybe start to move it in with John about now Butler's troops come into New Orleans and there's a little bit of friction and some concern. Um, so John, go right ahead if you like. Yeah, I was just wondering, Carolyn, since you uh, basically started the research or got the idea for the research off of this woman who was described in a newspaper or article or a little blurb in the media, uh, how you saw the media portraying the political, you know, like how they got uh, political with female roles, basically. All of a sudden they were being uh, seen more in the media, it seemed like. Sure. Well, for the longest time, especially in the three months that I was looking at specifically of the press, women were hardly being mentioned. You know, it was without a doubt. And, you know, you have reports from from Butler, from the troops, from Butler's wife that Southern women were finding ways to retaliate union occupation and in very vile ways, which we'll discuss later, I'm sure. So knowing that, you know, none of this is really mentioned in the newspapers until we get this little blurb. And I'm looking specifically at the Daily Delta. The Daily Delta didn't, you know, mention any of these acts until we come across this fierce female at the end of May. Mm -hmm. So this fierce female, I like how that, that's nice alliteration there. This fierce female, um, why did the newspaper focus on her? Well, I think, you know. I mean, obviously you're making some assumptions here, but why do you think they did? The editors, I should say. Sure. There's no identity to this woman. We don't even know her name. We don't know where she lives. We know nothing about her except that she has scars from smallpox and she has one eye. And I think they were trying to build this visual antithesis of this refinement of the high class Southern woman. She was everything a Southern woman should not be. And I think they were using this furious female as an example to dissuade women from getting too political, to take to the streets and retaliate against union soldiers and officers. I mean, her very physical appearance, right? They emphasize that she's has smallpox scars, right? Yes. Uh, I, mean, I mean, her very physical appearance itself is something that says uh, that they're not of that respectable class. Right. So they highlight her as a warning. Let me, let me even get some more high altitude. I'm going to press here. So, of course, as I said, I have a feeble memory. I can't remember the nature of the assignment entirely, but I think that what I was trying to get the students to see is to come to terms with newspapers as a source, as a source. Where are the challenges? Where are the limitations? And what's the value? So can you can help us understand newspapers as a source and, and, and how you utilize them? Sure. Well, as a historian, newspapers are very important for historical interpretation. But with this project, we learned that we always have to be skeptical of what's being written and put in those newspapers um, because you're always going to have biases. You're going to have editors sugarcoating things to almost as propaganda to make it seem like they're in better condition, to make New Orleans seem like it was in better condition than it actually was come May of 1862. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The uh, the really cool thing about uh, this new format is that we can pull questions pretty quickly. And one of the questions actually pertains to your paper mm -hmm. on this issue with this woman in particular. And it really goes back to something I think that's really important was she an actual person though, or was she created by an editor to get across a point or something like that? What are your thoughts on that, Carolyn? Actually, that is something that I considered in my paper. You know, while we may know nothing about this, she could be mm -hmm. a person of fiction. And I wouldn't put that past the editors either. Mm -hmm. Almost like a, they don't want to pin the, uh, the antagonist story on uh, the higher Southern elite women. So they'll make up someone who doesn't look anything like them or doesn't act anything like them to right. showcase their animosity. A stock character, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. 
it, it does. It, it does make sense, and, and I think that's that's possible. Let's go back again. The paper that you focused on again, Carolyn, is the the Daily, Daily Delta. I'm sorry, what is that again? The Daily Delta. Daily Delta. Mm -hmm. You said that it seemed almost like propaganda. Let's yeah. drill down into that point as well. We use the word discourse, which is just the kind of word that, as I always tell my students, don't use in any public history setting like this. But it's almost a word that's unavoidable here. So let's, again, I, I want to press you a little bit more. What's the, what's the political stance of the Daily Delta? The editors clearly have a stance. They have a mission, a purpose. What's, what is it? Sure. They were very much, at least outwardly, stalwart patriots. They, they were very much about supporting the Confederacy. And even at the time of occupation, there are articles being published that I actually have in front of me. Um, one read on, what was that? Did you want to share them or no? Um, it's on, It's printed on paper. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so on April 29th, one of the articles read, we do not know what response will be made to it in, to the occupation, but we feel confident that the honor and dignity of New Orleans will be maintained. And then even later on April, it was late April, around April 30th, I believe, um, they actually remarked about civilians and women. And they said the brutal threats and overpowering appearance of the Yankee fleet have no terrors for the Southern women. So even though New Orleans has fallen under complete control, of the union, they're still putting up a verbal fight almost. They're still maintaining that honor and dignity that they had talked about because at the end of the day, I think that's really what they were dealing with. If as long as they could maintain this image, this outward appearance of endurance wow. and perseverance, right. they were still as strong as ever. Right. I like what you say there. But I also say, and I think you're suggesting this as well, they're trying to create an appearance because in creating that appearance, they're also trying to shape political behavior as well. Uh, so that if that message of women behaving with resolution and determination and dignity and honor, if you say that and other people read that, that it's implied that, well, that's the standard that we have to uphold as well, right. right? That's how we have to carry ourselves. And so we see here that these um, descriptions of behavior, of how women should carry themselves, they're, you know, they're pregnant with, right, with politics. Uh, that's, here's what's happening again, as you mentioned at the very beginning, Carolyn, is what was occurring inside the household was deeply political, even though on that one hand, newspaper editors in the Confederacy and politicians, they're trying to deny it, but then they can't deny it, can they? And because it's abundantly apparent to everyone um, that with the occupation in New Orleans, the household now, there's no boundary between the household and the war, right? New Orleans is a, a great example, I think, of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was going to say, Carolyn, uh, some of the juicier details, what kind of retaliatory moves did these women do to the people who were in, in the city? Sure. Well, it varied. And this is this is my favorite part of the research was learning what these women actually did. Okay. Um, at, at the very minimum, if a Yankee soldier was walking down the street, some women would just cross it. If they appeared in church or on a streetcar, the women would just leave. <laughs> uh, and in more serious cases, sometimes these women would walk up to Yankee officers and look them in the eye, spit in the gutter, or even more so spit in their face. Oh in, in the very most extreme cases, I think we had women dumping their chamber pots onto the soldiers from the second story of their buildings. Um, right. wow. and was there some examples of clothing as well? Did they like sew Confederate flags on their dresses? Oh, Yes, they would they would don Confederate flags either as part of their dress or just carrying them around. They carry they definitely wore these brooches or cameos of their brothers, their husbands, their fathers who were off fighting at war. Um, they would hum patriotic tunes, just a multitude of things. 
right. Mm. And you know, I think for so long, historians have not fully appreciated how those gestures that are one again, deeply political, they're obviously highly public. And I'm still, again, after even reading your paper, I'm confused about how the Daily Delta, how they grappled with these women being so demonstrative um, about their support for the Confederacy and their disdain for Butler's troops. Yeah, it's it's interesting because they, again, there's hardly any mention of what these women were doing. In fact, I ne not once came across any sort of direct verbal, you know, indication that these women were in fact, targeting these troops on the, on the streets of New Orleans and doing these very vile acts of patriotism. Yeah, yeah. And really it's, you know, they mask any sort of rumors that, or reports that are being sent to the North or being sent out of the city with examples of women being patriots and defenders of the home and they're strong, but they're also preserving the honor. They were saying essentially, don't be fooled these women are being honorable and they're being virtuous even in these trying times when that simply wasn't the case. Right. <laughs> Just so that I have clarification here and I'll turn it back over to John. Did the Daily Delta, did they report the dumping of the chamber pots? They didn't do that. Never, no. Again, this is not an expertise of mine. Do you think that this dumping of the chamber pots, that that's something that became, um, almost kind of a myth that came out of it? Or do that? Do we have evidence elsewhere? Uh, I mean, clearly the soldiers and Butler's command report it, but is that, I guess what I'm trying to say, is that, do you think been exaggerated over time? You know, I, I don't think so. There might, you know, it might not have been common. Right. It definitely right. Might have been a case or two, but I know you can go down to New Orleans and you can see these chamber pots with a likeness of Ben Butler at the bottom. So I, again, I would not have these women. <laughs> do, you know when those, do you know when those were made? Are they are those lost cause post Civil War creations, or are they wartime? Do you know? I I cannot recall off the top of my head. That's hmm. that'd be a great project on material culture, especially <laughs> for, the, for the war. Right. Yeah, that's there. And Ben Butler's mug. Are we going to see Ben Butler tonight? I didn't bring a picture of him to show the audience. Most people uh, probably know uh, Ben Butler is. Uh, has a face that they say only a mother can love. <laughs> um, and the other thing about Ben Butler, let's be honest, you know, he's a politician from Massachusetts. And he, he's a politician that uh, if he were alive today would have no career, right? Because he simply, he doesn't have, have the good looks uh, that, would, uh, that would win over voters. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, uh Tyler Tierney actually asked my next question. How did Butler react to these kind of defiant actions? And that goes into what you said about with uh, the orders that he brought down. So do you want to go into what his actions were? Yes, this is where occupation gets very, very juicy and very, very dramatic for New Orleans, I believe. In response to these very vile, flagrant acts of patriotism, General Butler orders, um, General Orders Number 28. And it essentially says, that women who continue this sort of behavior shall be treated like prostitutes, essentially. I, I'm not, this is not directly quoting <laughs> the orders, but that's essentially the message that he was conveying. Right. He's licensing the treatment of women as women of the night should they continue to act in such foul manners towards unique troops. Right. 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 And, and, and so then how does, how does the paper report this? Order. How, what's their reaction to it? I mean, it's clearly outrage, but what do they say? Of course. I mean, it goes beyond the paper, too. You have the mayor of New Orleans writing Ben Butler saying, You cannot possibly compare these fine women to prostitutes. And Ben Butler even responds, You know, if they're going to act this way, then they're definitely acting unwomenly. Right. But, yeah. you know, in terms of the paper, it was more of a call to the men to defend the honor of these women. Uh, they posed this order almost as an unprovoked threat, almost of, like sexual violence. And this is where you have the newspaper calling out towards the soldiers, to the men, to their husbands, fathers, etc., to put up a fight 
in and remind them that they're fighting for the honor of their family, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, if I recall correctly in your paper, there is a is there a quote from Pierre Gustave to Tom Beauregard? There is a reference to it. Yes, I am. I actually have that. Yes, he writes, "Men of the South." Shall our mothers, our wives, our daughters, and our sisters be thus outraged by ruffianly soldiers of the North, to whom is given the right to treat the ladies of the South as common harlots? Hmm. So even on the fronts, we have men responding to what's going on in New Orleans. And I think there was this growing fear that the city was being emasculated. Right. Yeah. Oh, you're absolutely right there. So I'm going to push Karen a little bit more here. Go for it. <laughs> uh, your quote is a powerful one from Beauregard. And if I were to say to you, which I'm about to say actually to you, you know, that's just highly charged rhetoric uh, coming from headquarters, Confederate Army. And what can we really make of that? Does that really matter in terms of what Beauregard had to say? So it, try to help me understand, you know, why that proclamation from Beauregard help, help me understand how it has an impact on how the war is fought. And, I, and I'm not trying to put that much um, importance or significance to Beauregard's proclamation, but we know that there were similar proclamations made by generals and politicians elsewhere throughout the Confederacy. So I'll say the question again, it, it, Try to help me understand how such a proclamation, why is it significant? How does it, how does it have an impact on how the war is fought? Beauregard, not Butler's order. Yeah. Okay. Me. Beauregard, yes, I'm sorry. Um, so Beauregard, I think, you know, it's still early mm -hmm. on in the war. And I can't necessarily imagine that a lot of the soldiers at this point are feeling gloomy to say the least. Yeah. I think they're still very much encouraged to continue fighting this war. Right. It is right. only 1862. Right. But I think they're, you know, Beauregard is reminding the men that yes, you have this honor to, you know, for your country, you're right. fighting for the Confederacy. Right. But even more personally, you're also defending your own home. Yeah, yeah. So I think this was Beauregard reminding <laughs> the men what exactly they're fighting for and also preserving masculinity and that almost male hegemony that you know kind of stayed and lingered in some of these cities until union occupation i think it's very well said and it goes back to things that john and i have talked about on previous shows that when we do battle for the interpretation that we need to remind ourselves that the thoughts of women in the household were never far removed from the thinking and the feelings of these men. I reminded of John B. Gordon on July 1st here at Gettysburg, riding up and down along the lines, imploring the men to make an assault so that they would defend the honor of the women back at home. And so the, the last thing I'll say, because it connects to something that John and I and Aaron Chi and Dean spoke about last Thursday, and that's the escalation of the war. And so here again is a good example that you've given us from Beauregard is that we see that that's discourse, right? That's a, an official message that the soldiers hear, that message probably published in newspapers as well. And so that we start to have a perception of the enemy, right, as something that's diabolical and that the enemy, Ben Butler in this instance, is, is not fighting by the civilized rules of warfare. And so the idea that words don't matter which I think sometimes we succumb to today. We allow people uh, who are in charge of this country on both sides, they just kind of say whatever they want to say. And we know that the rhetoric has consequences. And I think what you found is a very good example of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember, uh, Pete, you said that uh, when some of the North Carolinians deserted after Gettysburg, mm -hmm. with John Futch and a few of the other, his comrades, you, you spoke about how the press labeled them and labeled the the women back home. And this seems like 
the opposite, but for a similar reason, a political reason. Yeah, that's right. And and it's something that I think that Carolyn and other students have have looked at that I think was looked over for far too long in, in many cases. And um, I'm wondering, Carolyn, about since we've talked about the uh, basically the, the higher class uh, white woman of New Orleans, how did the papers and media treat the poor women of New Orleans compared to them? Definitely. So one of the things that drove me crazy about this research was that really a lot of the source material favors the high class gentrified white woman. And you had to do a, a bit more digging in order to find the source material about the different groups of women from different socioeconomic standards and, and even based on race. I gotta say, I tried to find as much as I could on how African-American women enslaved and freed reacted to and viewed General Butler's arrival in New Orleans. And obviously if the paper wasn't going to include the political actions of high class white women, they were definitely not gonna include anything from the poor, except for our furious female, right. it was real, right. <laughs> and right. African-American women. Right. And so in my paper, I looked at how some African-American women had to find other channels in order to find that sort of retaliation. Right. And I looked at Vodun, as we know as voodoo, right. and some of these practices were sincerely spiritual and I think in some cases, without definitively confirming this, they might have turned to that in response to Butler's occupation of New Orleans. Hmm. So again, I know that you said the source material is scarce on that, right? but let's stick with enslaved women. So there's enslaved women in, of course, in New Orleans, and there's a fairly significant number, I imagine, of free black women as well. Um, and so the distinction between the two of those two classes, I think, is important. Uh, and that, of course, would have required you to do the kind of research that one would have expected for a master's thesis. Right. Like, you know, we just had a semester together. But uh, can we do? Can you do some speculation for us, please, about how do you think enslaved women viewed the occupation uh, by Butler's men? I think they could have viewed it as an array of things. Um, I, I think if they understood what the Union, uh, the arrival of the Union Army meant, that it could be a sign of liberation, could be. Um, they could also be just as fearful as any other New Orleanian citizen. I mean, some of the some of the women who were freed were occupant, like inhabitants of the city. So naturally, I think they'd be just as fearful. Um, of the arrival of, Union, of the Union Army. And this also plays into just the experience of being a, a Southern woman at the time. I think part of that experience is very, it's central centralized on this fear of sexual violence or rape, which was not, you know, exclusive to gentrified white women. I think any woman from any class experienced that fear with the arrival of any enemy fleet and, and Karen, I'll add quickly, who do you think is the most vulnerable to, to sexual violence and to rape? Who would have been the most vulnerable? Right. It's not the privileged white women, although they certainly were vulnerable, but not like poor white women and certainly not like enslaved women, right? Exactly. And of course, we've talked a little bit about this last week about sexual violence and rape um, during the Civil War. And there's some people who are doing great work on that. Crystal Feaster, as I believe how you pronounce her name, you cite her in your paper. Um, and she's at Yale, and she has been doing research for a considerable amount of time on sexual violence and rape during the Civil War. And I, my sense is that she has recovered or discovered that the sexual violence and rape against African American women is far greater than what we could have ever imagined. I'm not, I mean, I saw her in the archives uh, one day, so I know she's doing work there. I'm sure other places uh, uh, as well as well. So I'm going to, John, before I turn it back over to you, I want to stick with this issue of sexual violence. And can you help our audience understand the difference between sexual violence and rape? Hmm. 
I know it's tough. It's, it's a very fine line to walk. There is, there um, is yeah. I think you, you can't necessarily compare the two violences. They're just as disturbing. Yeah. Okay. Rape, I, at the time, I think had a lot more impact because you, you know, not only was your body being violated, but your own name, your own virtue was also being taken away essentially. And that meant a lot for some of these women at the time as it still does today. So, so, so obviously with rape then we're clear we're talking about this forced uh, physical intercourse, that's rape. Now, then when someone says, someone, well, how's sexual violence different from that? Do you have anything in your mind and, and to differentiate between the two? I mean, I, here's what I have thought about. And of course, you know, we all as scholars come to this differently. And, uh, and maybe we'll have some of our viewers who might have some other questions or insights about that. Uh, but I can imagine uh, the language that women of all classes in the South were subjected to by Union as well as Confederate soldiers in which men uh, would say things that were often very threatening and threatening in ways that of course would suggest that they would um, follow it up through some aggressive physical act. And it is the threat and the constant presence or pressure of that sexual violence that must, must have hovered around especially many of these isolated Southern communities where uh, the men are largely have disappeared except for old men and young guys, right? And the vulnerability that these women must have faced when you have a group of soldiers coming by, yelling, shouting, promising to do certain things, and maybe not fully acting upon it, but saying, guess what? If you don't show us what you have uh, out in the smokehouse, you don't give us the key to that lock, we're going to rape you, right? Or we're going to, I mean, they might not have used that word, but something like that. Uh, I came across an account uh, in which there is no court martial record for this. And that's why this subject matter is so difficult to research. But I have no doubt that it occurred. And it's in December of 64 in Sussex County, Virginia, in which part of Warren's Fifth Corps and some men in the Second Corps retaliated against the murder of some union stragglers and in retaliating, they burned homes to the ground. And in one instance, two officers approached a woman and I believe it was either her daughter or sister. And they said, we'll spare your house, but you're gonna have sex with us, right? And rape them. And God knows how many times instances uh, that that occurred, but that threat of sexual violence. And I'm sure uh, that we have maybe some people who are watching this or others who would be able to give us uh, examples as well. Just to bring back to your your, your research, Carolyn, is that the, the possibility of sexual violence, right, it was permeated, right? That living space uh, within New Orleans and, and the acts of those privileged women in protesting against the occupation, I think again speaks to the great risk that they took and also speaks to the fact that they were diehard Confederates. Right. right. At least some of them were not saying all of them, some of them. Were. <laughs> and I think the general orders also made that more apparent to them or really realized that fear for them. Licensing the treatment of women as prostitutes, as right. sexual commodities. Right. That's right. Even furthered that threat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for putting that. Excellent point. That's absolutely, yeah, absolutely the case. Um, John, go, go right ahead. Uh, we have a question from about 10 minutes ago that I think is still very important. Uh, were any of the women incarcerated because of their actions? Do we have any stories of that? Yes, actually. Um, one of my favorites, it was sort of, uh, I came across a story and it was outside of the timeline of my essay, so I couldn't include it at the time. Anne LaRue was arrested in New Orleans July 10th. And it was because she was out in the streets dressed in this white dress, but it also had the Confederate flag. And she was handing out incendiary pamphlets that over-exaggerated the successes of the Confederacy and erroneously talked about the capturing of McClellan. So a riot nearly started because of this woman. And it definitely resulted in the death, I think, of a policeman. And 
when she was brought before General Butler himself, he had questioned, you know, what her motives were, and she responded, I was feeling very patriotic that day. Um, but yes, she was incarcerated for a brief period of time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> feeling very patriotic. So, so the, the, the doubts of the paper, it, it never changes its editorial stance on this. Do they ever hold up these privileged women who are not acting according to what respectable women were supposed to do as patriots. Did they ever break from the party line and say, hey, well, you know what? After all, I'm glad that they're spitting at a Yankee soldier. I'm glad that they are walking across the street. Is there any shift at all in, in, in the editorial policy? No, and I think, in fact, this is probably one of the few constants of what was going on during occupation. I think the newspaper was very dead set in, um, in monitoring these women but presenting them as noble women it isn't until i think late june that you have union forces actually taking over the press right. and right. and instead of honoring these women for what they were doing these union officers were taking advantage of that freedom to the press to right. make jabs at them to right. mock them and openly ridicule them right. mm -hmm. and, you again, I think Carolyn, what it speaks to again, and that's what I wanted, I think, the class to see with working with newspapers is that newspapers are not transparent windows into the past. And I'm not suggesting that one can't recover what happened. And I'm certainly not suggesting that there's not truth to be found. But I think what you've discovered here is that with these publications that are so public and so intended to shape political behavior, that we need to think more about the intent and the audience. And so there was union, which would have been fascinating if we had you know, another semester together to look at those newspapers that were controlled now by union authorities and the ways that they could very well have exaggerated, this might be one of the ironies to this, exaggerated what privileged women did in protesting against Northern soldiers. And then it is that storyline, that narrative, that becomes the narrative that takes hold in the lost cause because for former Confederates, it's now not so embarrassing to say, hey, Southern women who were refined and privileged, they came out of their homes and in a defiant way, they acted like this, right? And so that would be an interesting line to follow here. I think again, all your work being presents and uh, reminds us of the great challenges of dealing with these sources and, and how you really have to just keep peeling them back, peeling them back to try to understand what's it what's it's there. Carolyn, you said, did you have some things you wanted to show us? I can't remember. Sure. So actually one of the things that I wanted to discuss was, you know, how can we understand the importance or the impact of these women and these flagrant acts of patriotism? And I was actually, I had a discussion with a friend the other day is um, over whether or not we could regard this as a small act of early feminism, or if it's really just the result of die hard Confederate patriotism. And when I was discussing this with them, I think it came to the fact that you, we, ha we really have to look at how these women were received in other <laughs> in other locations, including the North. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can always look at to the look to the personal diaries and journals of these women, because of course, especially the well-educated women, they're writing about this all the time and they're stating their opinions and how they're reacting. And even in my own paper, I looked at the diary of Clara Solomon, the 16-year-old uh, Jewish girl who was writing about the occupation quite often. So you can absolutely look to that. And when you're researching how these women reacted to this event, of course, they're talking about the Confederacy, defending the Confederacy, being patriotis, uh, patriotic right. uh, to the end. Right. But I think whenever this was brought up in Northern audiences, and I have two different publications from Harper's Weekly, the question of their femininity was always put at stake. Were these women being unwomanly? Right. And what I concluded was, actually, we'll, we'll look at the publications first, and then I'll keep going. Let me uh, let me share my screen. 
So one of the publications I have, how well can we see that? I can't. There we go. There we go. There you go. Nice. Okay. So this was from Harper's Weekly uh, right around July. And it's a very popular comic strip of the time. Um, we have a before and after uh, scene of Ben Butler's proclamation. And on the left, you have the ladies of New Orleans before General Butler's proclamation. And quite visibly, the two women are spitting directly at Union officers, Union soldiers. Their faces are, um, albeit sort of ugly, brutish. And they're donning Confederate flags and they're wearing the cameos. Their dresses are very unkempt. But then you look at the right and the caption says, after General Butler's proclamation, you have these very kempt, polite Southern women greeting the Union officer who is tipping his hat to them. And they look very calm. Their faces are beautiful. Their dresses are frankly lovely. So again, we're, we're really questioning the femininity of these women at the time. Um, another publication that I came across is the Starving People of New Orleans in Harper mm -hmm. Weekly as well. And obviously you have a lot of um, propaganda, unionist propaganda here. You have these humble union soldiers distributing food to the people of New Orleans. And you can see that you have different classes that are represented here from the gentry with their top hats and their fancy bonnets and petticoats to the lower class. You have children running about in the foreground. You even have an African-American um, mm -hmm. slave or freed woman towards, uh, towards the left of the composition. But I think what our eye is drawn to the most is the woman in the foreground that is lunging towards the soldiers. And when I saw this, I immediately thought of the figures of Furies in Greek mythology, these demonic women who often inflict punishment and famine and plague amongst you know, crime-ridden peoples or cities. And so I thought about that and how they're portrayed in art history. And that's what my mind came to when I saw this woman. She's not, again, the typical image of Southern refinement. In fact, she's infuriated. She's acting in very, you know, uneducated, you know, impolite mannerisms. And I think, again, as part of this unionist propaganda, the question of Southern femininity was always put at the forefront for these people. So coming back to the question, <laughs> I think, these women were getting a sample of political freedom in this time. I, I, I can't take the, you know, the idea that they're stepping out into the streets that were once relegated to men as a complete and total symbol of being patriotic. I would love to believe that some of these women understood that they were gaining some political freedom and some access to these very public political spheres in this time. Yeah, I think that's well said. I'm going to ask you some more about the, the visual culture real quickly. But again, I, I would just say that when we speak about women uh, finding their political voice during the war, we know that for some women, especially of the privileged classes in the Confederacy, uh, that that voice that they had during the war was a voice um, that they, they weren't intent on continuing in that position after 1865. I'm not saying they suddenly became depoliticized. They did not. But I would think with African-American women and maybe with poor women that we can see that the politicization that, they, that occurred during the war most certainly carried over into reconstruction. That would just be uh, my, my take on it. This idea of propaganda. Do you like, when you look at the, the, the visual culture, and thank you for giving us that excellent, I think, analysis of it. The word propaganda and using that word to our audiences and using that word to students, it's a loaded word. Is that a good word to use, propaganda? Because I'm starting to believe that I can't believe anything, right? Because I'm going back to the Daily Delta, that's propaganda. Now we got Harper's, right? <laughs> Yankee paper, that's propaganda. What are we to do? <laughs> well, I think this is very compelling imagery for the North. 
um, because it's one thing to hear about the successes of your military on the uh, military front, but I think it's also encouraging to see imagery of the other side losing. So more than anything, you know, these images that depict New Orleans in a terrible, terrible state right. is just as encouraging as receiving good news from the war. Mm. John, would you like to wrap up with any final thoughts or questions here? Uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering, we, we have this idea of Ben Butler through popular history and what we've, we've encountered with him. And I've always wondered, you know, about, you know, the old line that he was called spoons and he was like, you know, he had sticky fingers. He would, you know, take stuff out of homes and, you know, he pocket silverware, uh, through doing this research, Carolyn, what has your idea of him become in this? And I know it's just one paper, but there's been a lot of research done for that paper has has an idea of who he was as far as leadership is concerned come to light for you personally yet or do you think that would be something else that it's for another time i think i'd need to spend more time looking at this man in different areas of the civil war i know at one point he was in talks with clara barton in the north to free some of her companions and it, I think it really depends on where you're coming from in history. If you are looking at Ben Butler through the lens of some of these women, obviously he's a villain. But I think to the North, he's doing what he can. There's political cartoons of him going down to New Orleans with like a mop and broom, as if the North was sending him to go clean up the South's act, <laughs> quite literally. So, so I think it definitely depends, you know, what era of his career are you looking at specifically? He's, I think he's a very complex historical figure. I know there are two people who are working on Butler biographies. I'm not sure where they are in terms of how close they're to finish. Brian Jordan, who is, is a Gettysburg College uh, alum, I should note, uh, and Elizabeth Leonard, who I taught at Colby for many years, and he's an accomplished scholar. So we'll get uh, some other takes on Ben Butler. Brian Lusky, who was on our show a few weeks ago, uh, Men is Cheap is the title of his book. He has some very good stuff on Butler's operations on the peninsula um, uh, outside Norfolk. Uh, they, I think, are, are also enlightening uh, as well. So, uh -huh. Carolyn, uh, before we let you go here, tell us one great thing in Chicago that we all got to either see, taste, hear, drink. What is it, Carolyn? <laughs> and you can't say go to Wrigley. That's 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 the easy out. So I don't want that as one of the. Uh... <laughs> well, you couldn't go to Wrigley right now. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're yeah. still reopening. But I think if you were to visit right now, I mean, the streets are empty in Chicago. So you could just drive around. Well, let's post pandemic. Let's we're gonna think. You know, <laughs> that when the uh, when the clouds finally disappear and we have our reality back to us, where would you tell us? What would we do? What should we do? Um, I am always a fan of the Art Institute. I have found it great for many projects from yeah. exhibitions there. They always do a phenomenal job. A fantastic yeah. impressionist collection. It's phenomenal. And yeah. then, of course, in terms of foods, yeah. you definitely have to try Chicago deep dish pizza from Lou Malnati's. Okay, good. We got it right here. I'm glad you said that because that came up in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We have an Illinois person in the comments. Absolutely. <laughs> Carolyn, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank and, you. And you. You can see she, you're a very, very talented uh, historian and very excited to see what your future holds. My fear is, not fear, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I know that law school is maybe a possibility for Carolyn and you'd be a, a damn good lawyer. Maybe you could do preservation law. But if you were to do that, it certainly would be a loss to the historian profession because you certainly have, I think, a lot of talent in that area as well. So it was a great deal of fun having you here. Looking forward to seeing you in the fall. Carolyn is going to be in senior seminar. We've not settled on your project yet, have we? Not right. yet. It's still not a, yet. A, lot of good, a lot of good ideas. A lot of good possibilities. <laughs> well, I'm very much looking forward to working with you again this fall. So, Carolyn, thank you so much. My regards to your parents as well. And also, again, um, my thoughts about your grandfather. I had no idea, but I'm glad we could remember him and all the service that he gave this country today. Thank you so much. 
before uh, before we wrap up totally, I have a Memorial Day surprise for Pete uh, because I sometimes sit in the office and I'm bored. And I, need to, I need to figure out something for for the show, and uh, so so I have a video editor now uh, myself, obviously, but a video editing software, and I played around with it, and I made something for the show, Pete, and I thought that you would enjoy it. And <laughs> Caroline can give her thoughts on it too, because I can always use all the opinions I can get, and the comments are going to be full of that. So yeah. I'll put it up here, and you can see how you like it. All right, here we go. So there you go. You Very can, nice. You can have an intro. And hey, then, I like the intro a great deal. You're wondering about music, and I'm like, well, you got to have an intro. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we've needed that, so that's a nice touch. Thank you so much. That was, was that us last summer? Yeah, that was us at CWI Summer Conference last year. Yeah, yeah after you gotten off stage, you were re nice and relaxed, and we just had a nice, chill conversation. You're good. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Carolyn, again, thank you so much. Uh, you, yeah. So we have Wednesday, we should note Wednesday, we have a um, getting out of our rotation just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we have Jim Downs, Jim Downs, who is going to start this fall at Gettysburg College as the new Gilder Lehrman Chair in Civil War Studies. He is going to uh, join us Wednesday at seven o'clock. He's going to speak about uh, cholera. Uh, from a historical perspective. And we'll talk about also Civil War Medicine as well. That is a specialty of his. Uh, Jim did his first book entitled Sick from Freedom. It's about emancipation and the healthcare or lack of in contraband camps. All of that is going to provide a very important background, I, I think, to a conversation about uh, COVID-19, right? About the pandemic today. So mm -hmm. 7 o'clock this Wednesday, Jim Downs, our new Civil War historian coming to Gettysburg College this fall. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Uh, and you as well, Tim. Yes. With See, our new intro. Yes. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Carolyn, again so much. Really appreciate it. And it's great to see young talent on here. You don't appear getting tired of seeing us old guys on here. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 Great to be here. So, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Have, have a great rest of your Memorial Day. Be safe, and we will see you on Wednesday. Take care.